Hello, Brian Miller Hicks here, continuing series of PowerPoints on geology and earth science. So the topic today is earthquakes. For us who live in San Diego, Southern California area, earthquakes are obviously very significant. We live in what's called the continental borderland or near the boundary of tectonic plates that are shifting against each other steadily but slowly. In the shifting, uh, when these two when faults meet and then shift against each other, either up or down or sideways, they fracture rock, and the fracturing of rock is what creates an earthquake. This um, slide you see here is the disastrous Tohoku 2011 earthquake in Japan. The damage, destruction you're seeing is not the direct cause of earthquake shaking, rather it's caused by the generation of a seismic sea wave or a tsunami, which swept into shore, in this case killing thousands of people and causing billions of dollars in damage. So when you talk about earthquakes, you need to talk about the properties of rock. One property of rock geologists call elastic rebound. It means rock can be deformed, stretched, stressed and strained to some extent, and it will deform in response to the stress. But then it reaches a certain point where the stress is greater than the strength of the rock. And at that point, the rock will break, will fracture, release energy. And in the case of tectonic plates shifting against each other, cause um, waves of energy to emanate through the rock that we know of as seismic waves, seismic um, earthquake generating waves. Um, and the fracturing of rock, of course, is what causes earthquakes. The analogy is taking a stick which bends to some extent till it gets to a point where the bend or the stress is greater than the strength of the stick. It slips and causes uh, the release of energy. Seismic waves are what is released during an earthquake. The bigger the earthquake, the more energetic, the more powerful, the stronger these seismic waves are. So seismic waves, generally speaking, are vibrations of energy that are released by fracturing rock and emanate through the rock surrounding the fault. All earthquakes are caused by failure of rocks at a fault, whether it's an old existing fault or a brand new fault that's generated or created by the earthquake itself. So how do we measure earthquakes? How do we detect them? Well, if you look at this very beautiful instrument, this is a seismometer invented and crafted by Chinese a long time ago, centuries ago. It's actually a beautiful piece of art, in my opinion. The principle of this is that inside there is a triggering mechanism. When an earthquake occurs, the jar shakes back and forth and the direction of the shaking will release metal balls from the dragon's mouth dropping into the frog's mouth. So you get a general sense of the direction of shaking through this instrument. It's not precise, it's not, doesn't give us a magnitude or a number of anything, but it tells you that an earthquake happened, whether you knew it or not, and and it gives you an idea of the direction of earthquake energy propagation. A modern instrument seismometer that we use today, uh, it's called a seismograph. Graph means writing. So a seismograph is a seismometer that leaves a record of seismic waves. So what we do is we drill a hole in rock. We set a box down at the bottom of the hole. Inside this box, we have 
a suspended pendulum with a heavy weight. And we have a drum with paper rolled around it. As the earthquake occurs, the box shakes back and forth. The wire moves back and forth. The mass, the weight does not move because of inertia. So as the box and everything it's on moves with the earthquake, this also moves the roll of paper, which moves back and forth and also rotates, rolls around. And that gives us a recording of seismic waves. Okay, it's called a seismometer or a seismograph. Here is a photograph of an actual seismometer, seismograph, and the actual paper record that this produces is called a seismogram. Let's look at these seismic waves in a little more detail. There's three basic types of seismic waves. There are P waves, S waves, and surface waves. A P wave is a primary wave. An S wave is a shear wave or secondary wave. Surface waves occur primarily near the Earth's surface. So let's break it down a little bit more. P waves are the fastest waves that come out from an earthquake event. Okay, so on a seismogram record, they will be the first waves to be picked up by the motion of the seismograph and the motion of the paper records the first waves as a P wave. So P waves are the fastest. They're not the highest energy, but they get there first. Then come the S waves, shear waves or secondary waves, which are a little more energetic, but slower. Their speed of an S wave is about 60% the speed of a P wave. And then come surface waves, which are the slowest of the three types. But unfortunately, they tend to be the most energetic and the waves with the highest amplitude. Amplitude is the height of the wave record measured from this baseline on up. Because surface waves have the highest amplitude, the most energy and are closest to the surface, they're often really the most destructive waves you will experience in an earthquake because of those reasons I just cited. So the P wave hits you first, like a bang, and then you'll experience you'll experience a delay. Then the S waves will come by and they kind of roll the ground and the surface waves will come by later, shake the ground back and forth, up and down, all around. Now, every single earthquake whether it's a small earthquake or a large earthquake, will generate each and every one of these waves. All earthquakes generate P waves, S waves, and surface waves. Let's take a closer look at how these waves move the ground and how they affect the ground on which we live. So P waves, fastest waves, are what we call compressional waves. So they're moving back and forth and both um, squeezing and stretching the ground. So as they squeeze the ground, they compress the ground. And as they um, go back out the other way, they cause a stretching of the ground per se. So a compression and a dilation, kind of like a spring moving back and forth, compressing and expanding. Okay. Then come the body waves, or I'm sorry, P waves and S waves collectively are known as body waves because they occur fairly deeply or deeper under the surface of the earth. So after the P waves come the S waves, shear or secondary waves, and the motion of a shear wave is kind of like if you take a rope, fix it at one end and you move it up and down you'll see a traveling wave going through the rope. That's a, the motion of the soil particles or the rock particles as the seismic wave goes through it. So wavy up and down motion, okay? 
Then come the, more, the destructive surface waves. The love waves sort of cause an undulation of the ground, like a snake crawling through the grass, back and forth near the surface, and you get kind of an undulation motion. The Rayleigh waves, again, surface waves, cause the ground to move up and down, just like there are waves actually traveling through the ground or across the ground. And a lot of times in a major large earthquake, these ground waves are actually visible, quite scary. Now, each and every one of these waves and the energy it releases is destructive. Again, the most destructive waves are the surface waves, the love waves and the Rayleigh waves because they're so close to the ground surface. And altogether, um, these waves, if you're a building sitting on top of the ground, you'll experience all these types of motion as the ground moves underneath you. So you might ask yourself, how do we know where earthquakes occur? Let's say we're living in San Diego and a large earthquake occurs in South America somewhere. How do we locate where that earthquake actually occurred? Well, we do it by comparing records from seismograms around the world. We have thousands of seismographs located at stations all over the world on every continent and some, I believe, on the ocean floor. The hazards, of course, all relate back to seismic wave energy. So again, when a fault breaks, it creates energy emanating through the rock. The point on the fault at which the earthquake occurs is called a focus or a hypocenter. The point on the Earth's surface above which it occurs is called the epicenter. And here's the fault, this black line you see here. So how do we detect where these earthquakes are? We use a factor that's evidence um, within the properties of seismic waves. P and S waves, as you know, travel at different speeds. The P wave travels faster than the S wave. So we can plot, let's say an earthquake occurred in South America. We can plot the time of arrival of the P wave, and then we can plot the time of arrival of the S wave. We can find out the difference. Here we have a time scale. That's the P-S interval. So this is the time difference between the arrival of the P wave and the arrival of S wave. You'll see as that time interval increases, let's say a one minute separation of time, that means the earthquake is something like 800 kilometers away. If it takes five minutes for the S waves to arrive after the P waves, project this line all the way across to here, and that means the earthquake is about 3,500 kilometers away. So we can use this property to actually find the location of an earthquake. So let's say we have an earthquake occurring in the mid-Atlantic here. The PS interval recorded in a seismograph in Paris gives us a distance of 6,700 kilometers away from the earthquake. That's this radius described here. A seismograph in Montreal records a distance of 8,400 kilometers to the earthquake away from Montreal. That's this red radius described here. And finally, from Sao Paulo to the epicenter, it, according to the PS time interval, it's 5,500 kilometers. So we plot all these radiuses or circles around the seismograph station and where those circles intersect, we have pinpointed or triangulated the location of the earthquake. Okay. So now that we know how far away the earthquake is, where it was located, 
we need to get an idea of its strength, its power. That's where we come to earthquake magnitude scales. Now, the um, most common earthquake scale that people are most familiar with is the Richter scale. But before we get to that, let's talk about the modified Mercalli scale. This was set up by an Italian gentleman. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when he lived. Um, doesn't occur to me right now, I'm drawing a blank. But he set up a relative magnitude scale, meaning that the closer you were to the earthquake, the more you felt it. Makes sense, common sense. If an earthquake occurred, let's say, the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 occurred near Santa Cruz in the San Francisco Bay Area, basically. So the Mercalli scale right around the epicenter is an eight. As you get farther from the earthquake, it goes to seven, goes to six. Okay, that means that the farther away you are from an earthquake, the less the effects are felt. By effects, we mean things like shaking of buildings, destruction of buildings, rupturing of pavements, pipe, pipelines, uh, the human element, whether you felt it or didn't feel it. If you're really far away from the earthquake, you may not have felt it at all or just barely felt it. If you're very close, you could have felt it very strong. Here's the Richter scale. It's the one most commonly used. It's useful for pinpointing or um, judging, assessing the power of earthquakes against each other. So what this graph shows is a seismograph record up here. Here's that PS time interval of 24 seconds. Here's the amplitude of the surface waves, 23 millimeters. With those known data points, we can then plot the magnitude on this scale. So the time interval of 24 seconds is plotted here on the SP second time interval, 24 seconds right here. That means the earthquake is, in this case, is 220 kilometers away. The amplitude of the waves is 23 millimeters, which we plot here. And we draw a line from this point, and we draw a line from this point to this point. Once again, I didn't have my laser pointer out. Here's that 24 second interval. The amplitude of the waves, 23 millimeters, measured from here to here. You take this time interval, plot it here, 24 seconds. You take this amplitude. 23 millimeters, plot it here, draw a line from here to here, and where it crosses the magnitude scale, it gives you the magnitude of an earthquake. Let's say the magnitude was 50 millimeters. Then you plot the line from here to here, that gives you a slightly greater magnitude, which makes sense. If the amplitude is larger, the magnitude is larger. I'm going to talk a little bit about the interior of the Earth. Turns out that we didn't know much about the interior of the Earth until beginning of the 20th century, the 1910s and 20s, when some very smart geophysicists, scientists figured out that by tracking seismic waves from one location on the Earth's surface to being picked up by seismographs, on the other side of the Earth, for example, they could plot the path of seismic waves and give us an indication of what the Earth interior was actually made of. Turns out, as you know, the Earth is layered. It has a mantle here. Can't, the crust is out here, of course. You have a mantle, and you have an outer core, which is liquid metal, and you have an inner core, which is solid. Turns out, for example, that shear waves do not go through liquid. So they will not travel all the way through like these P waves do. Um, some of the waves will bounce off the edge or the interface between the mantle and the core. So looking at thousands of 
ray paths or paths of seismic waves for the Earth's interior. Plotting all those wave paths, scientists came up with an idea that the Earth's interior actually has a layered structure. For example, here we have earthquakes generating seismic waves. The P waves hit the liquid outer core. They'll bend or deflect or refract. The S waves will not go through, but the um, P waves will. So all this just means to say that we get a good picture of the interior layered structure of the Earth through tracking seismic waves. Now, as you know, just about everything in geology relates back to tectonics, plate tectonics. Earthquakes are no exception. Earthquakes occur only in particular tectonic settings that have to do with the motion of plates and especially the motion of plates at plate tectonic or at tectonic plate boundaries. So you see here a world map and you see here these bands of color. Uh, west coast of South America, the uh, South Pacific, Japan. These of course mark the tectonic plate boundaries around the Pacific Ocean, also known as the Ring of Fire. This is where subduction takes place through and represented by trenches like the Aleutian Trench, the Japan Trench, the Mariana Trench, the Peru-Chile Trench. So at all these locations, the ocean plate, Pacific plate, is subducting or diving underneath other ocean plates or under continental plates. Now, if you look at, let's look at the, um, the um, plate boundary along the west coast of South America. The blue dots are shallow earthquakes, the yellow are intermediate, and the red are deep. This makes sense because if you know the motion, the orientation and direction of the plate boundary and the direction of subduction here, the Pacific plate, actually the Nazca plate right here, is subducting towards the east and underneath the South American plate. So the um, deepest earthquakes would come farthest away from the trench. Shallowest earthquakes would be closest to the trench. So let's talk about how um, plate tectonics influences earthquake occurrence and location. Earthquakes occur at divergent boundaries continental collision boundaries, transform fault boundaries, and subduction zone boundaries. All four types of boundaries here. As the plates of rock collide with each other, they cause huge amounts of stress. You get slices of rock moving up and down against each other. As they do so, they create earthquakes. In a subduction convergent boundary, the ocean plate here is scraping the bottom side of the continental plate and where that scraping occurs, earthquakes are created. In a transform fault, the, the uh, um, block here is moving in this direction, the block here is moving in this direction, they scrape against each other, causing and creating earthquakes. And finally, at divergent boundaries, where the crust, seafloor crust is separating, or the continental crust, if you have a divergent boundary on land, and that drops down blocks of rock in the central area through normal faulting, and that means um, you get the creation of earthquakes through faulting at that location. Okay. So we all know that earthquakes are dangerous. We living here in San Diego have felt some earthquakes, the 2010 Easter Sunday earthquake, for example, and we know they can cause damage, they can injure and kill people, um, they're very scary. What are some of these hazards? 
So all that energy releases waves which cause property damage because of shaking. Here's a photo of the Haiti earthquake in January 2010. It was a rather large 7.0 Richter scale earthquake. It shook up a lot of buildings and damaged a lot of property, totally destroying totally destroying this church. You can see it's a church by the crucifix here. Now, this building pretty much fell apart completely. And one of the reasons the Haiti earthquake was so destructive to property and life is because they have no building code. A lot of the buildings are unreinforced masonry with no steel reinforcing. So when an earthquake hits, it's just the building will crumble, shake apart. Closer to home, 2010 Easter, Mexicali earthquake. This is the actual rupture of the fault. This is the fault trace. And when this fault broke, when it fractured, it caused the earthquake. This is what we call a fault line scarp. You can see it's a thick black line. So the ground on this side, or excuse me, the ground on this side dropped down relative to the ground on this side by a couple meters, it looks like. So this kind of major shifting or breakage of the ground can generate obviously a lot of energy. So more we learn about earthquakes, the better we can plan. We can plan where we live. We can plan our structures. We can plan the zoning of certain types of buildings and certain type of land use. Here near San Diego, we have La Jolla area, as you see here. This is a map drawn extracted from the San Diego Seismic Safety Study, which classifies land according to geologic hazard categories. Now you can see these red lines striking through northwest to southeast. These are the traces or the map traces of faults that we know of. So this is the Rose Canyon Fault Zone a fault um, often does not come as a single break. It often occurs as a series of breaks, anywhere from a few feet wide to hundreds of feet wide. And so that zone of many different faults, more or less parallel to each other, is called a fault zone. Here in La Jolla, we have the Rose Canyon Fault Zone, which means the zone contains the Rose Canyon Fault. We have the Mount Soledad Fault Zone. We have the Country Club Fault Zone. So the red lines, where they're solid, that means we have good evidence that the fault was actually mapped through there. Where the line is dashed, like you see here, it's buried perhaps by urbanization or fill, or um, we just couldn't get to it to map it. Out here in the ocean, the dots mean the fault's concealed because we cannot see it actually um, under the ocean water and the ocean floor. So what if you wanted to buy a house in La Jolla and you wanted to buy a house that sits right, let's see, let's see, so it's right here. So you go to the city and you look at this map and you go, geez, my house I want to buy is sitting right on top of this fault. Do I want to buy it? That's pretty useful information. You might not want to buy it. Or if you buy it, you might be prepared to, to um, reinforce your house, uh, make sure it doesn't fall apart during an earthquake. Okay, so that's where fault mapping and fault zoning and land use planning all come in handy. Let's look at um, a hazard that often occurs in certain places from earthquake 
um, generation of earthquakes. In 1964, way before many of you were born, we had the Good Friday earthquake near Anchorage. In this case, we had a subdivision sitting on a bluff overlooking the ocean. The earthquake came along, developed cracks in the ground. And look here, we have a clay layer. This is called the bootlegger cove clay. This bootlegger cove clay is glacial clay. In other words, it came out of melting glaciers during the Pleistocene, laid down in quiet water, accumulated a thickness of very soft, slick clay, which then was buried by younger glacial sediments, sands, gravels, etc. So the earthquake came along, put cracks into the ground, and the cracks weakened all this material up above the clay, and the material above the clay slid along this cliff, or slid along this slick, soft and wet bootlegger cold clay right into the ocean. So this is an example of the failure of land caused by earthquake shaking. In other words, landsliding is a definite, well-defined hazard created by earthquakes. Here's another hazard. This doesn't look very dangerous, but on a large scale it can be. This is a phenomenon known as a mud geyser or a sand volcano. So this happens when you have close to the surface, you have a shallow water table, you have loose sand down in the water table area, earthquake comes along, shakes everything up, the sand which is loose and saturated, the grains come apart, the water separates the grains and liquefies these layers of sand. And if you have fractures forming up above the sand, the sand can actually shoot up these vertical fractures and come out as little mud geysers or sand volcanoes, if you will. Let's talk about tsunami. Tsunami, of course, as I've already mentioned, was a major, major uh, cause of destruction, injury, and death from the uh, 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Why does tsunami occur and how are they associated with earthquakes? So up here you have a subducting plate. As it subducts, it rubs against the overriding plate, causing generating earthquakes. And then maybe it gets stuck. These two plates sort of lock together. Then stress builds over time. The entire coastline is actually rising from the stress. Then the stuck area suddenly ruptures, creating an earthquake, releasing energy. As this rupture occurs, the seafloor may move up or down, causing the water column up above to rise up in a large bulge of water, which then wants to level itself out. As it levels itself out, it sends waves out from itself from the side of the earthquake. And some of these waves come onto land as big slabs of water, 10, 20, 30 meters in height, depending on the shape of the coastline and the proximity of the earthquake, and cause that destruction. So again, tsunami generation from an earthquake, subduction zone. The, the sea surface is pulled down as the seafloor is pulled down, springs back up and sends waves out in both directions. This can also work as the seafloor is pushed up as well. Here's a graphic depicting a tsunami generation. Earthquake here, displacement, sending waves of energy and lifting the sea surface. The tsunami comes, uh, spreads out from there at very fast speeds, mind you. 800 kilometers an hour is about 500 miles an hour. As it approaches land, the, the uh, sea floor gets shallower and that slows down the wave, slows down the bottom of the wave faster so that you get the top of the wave outrunning the bottom 
and that causes a crest in a wave and a breaking wave to occur, crashing onto the land. So 500 miles an hour in open sea. If you're a boat or a ship sitting on top of the wave here, you may not even feel it. You may feel, feel or see a so slight swell, but if you're close to shore, you would witness a disastrous crashing slab of water. Over here at the shoreline, it's at about 30 miles an hour, which is significantly slower, but still you cannot outrun a 30 mile an hour wave. I don't care if you're Usain Bolt, you still can't run that fast. The famous Indonesian earthquake in 2004, uh, December 26th, I believe, caused a huge series of tsunami waves. And it's not just one wave. If you drop a pebble in a pond, you see it's not just one ripple, it's a series of ripples. Same thing with tsunami, it's a series of sea waves. This person is in danger, as are all these people as it comes in. Destruction. This is what happened in part on the island of Indonesia, island nation. Just wiped out entire cities and towns. Now, how do tsunami travel in the open ocean? Let's say an earthquake occurred in Alaska it would send out tsunami that would take about five hours to get to Honolulu. If the earthquake occurred on the coast of South America, it would get there in about 12 hours. The point of this is tsunami are ocean crossing waves. With all that energy behind them, they can travel for thousands and thousands of miles across open ocean and cause destruction in far distant lands, lands thousands of miles from where the earthquake actually occurred. Famous earthquake, 1906 in San Francisco. This is a, an actual photo taken on that fateful day, I believe it's April 10th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, People, and you can see um, damage to these buildings from the shaking and the buildings in San Francisco, and even today, some are built right next to each other and even up against each other. So during an earthquake, not only do the individual buildings shake, but they can shake and bang against each other and cause more damage. But the major hazard from this earthquake in 1906 was fire. These billowing clouds are clouds of smoke caused by many fires caused by the disruption of gas lines. Remember in 1906, many homes were lit by gas, gas light. Um, so many thousands of these lines broke causing huge destructive raging fires. Here's a depiction of a section of San Francisco. North is up to the top of the picture. This is the area that was damaged by the fire. Significant chunk of the city. It only stopped when they bulldozed a fire break around the fire and cleared the area of more fuel to the fire. So the fire eventually burned itself out, but it raged for a couple of days and killed a number of people. Okay, so we know that earthquakes happen. I'm a professional geologist, and when people hear that I'm a professional geologist, they will often ask me, well, when's the big one going to come? First of all, there's no such thing as, there is and there isn't such thing as the big one. Usually people are talking about the San Andreas Fault, which can indeed generate large earthquakes, but the San Andreas Fault doesn't generate just one earthquake, it'll generate many earthquakes as it continues to move. There are faults which will create bigger earthquakes, like the uh, faults that subduct underneath the west coast of South America. In fact, the subduction zone fault 
along the west coast of South America created the largest ever recorded earthquake of around 9.5 Richter scale off the coast of Santiago, Chile. Okay, so we know that about earthquakes, they happen. Can we predict them? In the long term, yes, sort of. In the short term, no. What do I mean by that? Well, how do we even know when earthquakes occur and what um, record they might leave? Well, it turns out that we can go out to an area, we know there's faults, we can dig a trench, and maybe we'll come up with something like this, where we see a fault that ripped its way through the sands down here, so we can clearly see a fault trace. We can see a second fault that not only goes through the sands, but also through the gravels to here, where it stops. And a third fault goes all the way through the sands, the gravels, all the way to the Earth's surface. Now, of these three faults, which do you think is the youngest fault from this record? stratigraphic record, you can actually see these faults and you can see how far they go through and whether they get to the Earth's surface. Well, this fault three is the youngest because it goes all the way through everything to the surface. This fault one is the oldest fault because it goes only through the older sands. So this is the kind of record we look for when we're trying to assess the activity of a fault. A given fault may have many breaks in it where it's displaced layers all the way up from the bottom that we can see through the top. And you'll see successive steps of breaks that the fault has broken the layers, which means there have been multiple earthquakes along that fault. So this kind of record is very handy. And we use this kind of record to assess the activity of fault. An active fault is any fault that's shown breaks that are 11,700 years or younger. An inactive fault has got to be show breaks that are older than that. 